No, there is no benefit to be a tool and to be the implementation point of a proxy war. And if you if you're not sure about that, go and ask the Ukrainians at the moment in in the in the trenches. You know, this is the horrible thing, the the perverse thing of this proxy war method that really the U.S. has perfected by now. You know, in the in the Vietnam War, they still needed to send their own troops, but by now they have figured out how to how to manage to have other states fight the wars that they want to have. And th this is difficult to do, and it takes a long time, and it's very sophisticated. It's just for the tool itself. I mean, it is a tool. I mean, nobody cares about the hammer. Nobody cares about, I mean, if the hammer breaks, the hammer breaks. Fine, I'm going to get another one, right? You don't want to be the tool. And that's why I would like to sell more neutrality to places, not in the sense of you should not take any position or any action, but you need to be aware that it's better to have your own position and to guard your own interest toward both sides. Hello, everybody. I would like to share a video today with you that is an interview conducted with me. It was done by two Armenian colleagues, Hovik Manucharyan and Aspet Petrosian, who on their YouTube channel and podcast regularly speak about Armenia and the whole Caucasus region more generally. I encourage you to subscribe to their channel. They are doing very interesting work there too. The two of them were interested in neutrality, so we talked about that for about an hour. Here you go. Hello and welcome to this Conversations on Grung episode. Today we're talking about a field of study that came to our attention called neutrality studies. So we have with us a champion of this field, Dr. Pascal Lota. Hello, Pascal. Thanks for coming on our show. Hello, Pascal. Hello, and thank you very much for having me today. Absolutely. So since this is your first time with us, would you tell us a little bit about yourself and the interests that have led you to this formal study of the concept of neutrality? Well, thanks for your interest, because there's not that many people who want to talk about neutrality, but I'm always happy to. Um, so my name is Pascal Lotta. I'm a Swiss citizen, but I'm living for over 10 years now in Japan. And I came here to do my uh, quite a while ago, but finally to do my MA and PhD. And during my PhD at the National Graduate Institute for Policy Studies in Tokyo, I worked for four years on uh, neutral states and Japan during the Second World War. Uh, turns out that nobody bothered looking at what um, Spain, Sweden and Switzerland, those were the three main ones that I looked at, what they did with Japan during the Second World War, diplomatically mainly. So I went into the archives and, and looked at the diplomatic correspondence. And as it turned out, the, these three countries were quite different. Uh, although Sweden and Switzerland were very close in terms of how their political setup worked, um, both democracies, one direct, the other one a parliamentary democracy, um, similar history and tradition of neutrality at that point. Um, but Sp Spain was completely different, right? Spain was a fascist dictatorship under Francisco, Francisco Franco, who had just won the Spanish Civil War. But Spain also remained neutral. And the, the fact that these, all three of them remained neutral successfully and were not invaded and so on, allowed them to, to keep diplomatic contacts with Japan as before, and it allowed them to do a lot of things and actually exactly the same things, more or less, in, in terms of um, connecting with the, with the outside world and, and acting as me, uh, intermediaries and, and political actors in their own rights. Um, and that was fascinating. So I, be and while studying this, I realized that um, a lot of the discussion about neutrality in Switzerland and in Europe in general misses a very important point, which is that um, never mind whether you have a, a long-standing neutrality policy, yes or no, if you are not part of a conflict, you become neutral, even in an analytical term, and then that allows you to do things. And that's something that I decided then to focus on once I was done with the PhD and build up this uh, this field of neutrality studies, because um, nobody bothers looking at those states systematically who try to remain third party, you know, who, who try to remain systematically out. And international relations has developed a lot of terms to describe this without actually looking at it balancing, hedging, bandwagoning, and so on. But these are all terms of art that are somehow, you know, just try to explain away or to 
not bother very much with with these third states and i want to do the opposite and and my claim is that it, within any kind of international system or and and any kind of um, conflict constellation, the third parties, those that are, do not fight or those that try to remain at, in in a good relation with with those who are fighting, be it di a direct war, be it a trade war, be it be it just a uh, small scale conflict, those third parties matter a lot, and those third parties influence the whole system, and that's what I'm trying to build up. Hmm. Is there a formal theoretical basis for neutrality studies? And when was it introduced and coined? Uh, I'm coining it as we speak. I see. <laughs> <laughs> I, I try, I, I, um, you know, neutrality studies as a field of study doesn't exist. I um, have a research project, which I first implemented for three years at Waseda University in Tokyo, and now for five years at Kyoto University. And I call it neutrality studies because I would like people to systematically focus on the party states. So, Pascal, let's relate to an old saying attributed to Edmund Burke that the only thing necessary for evil to triumph in the world is for good men to do nothing. Now, we've actually Googled and, and found out that maybe this is misattributed to Edmund Burke, but the point remains uh, valid. Is neutrality really neutrality? Are you really neutral if you sit by and watch your neighbors commit genocide? Yes. No, this is, this is the core of the issue. And maybe i need to say that neutrality in a world that is dominated by good and evil if this is the only two poles you have then neutrality cannot exist there's no conceptual space so as soon as we frame the international world in terms of just war theory where some somebody is always bad and somebody's always good then you cannot be neutral which is also why in the me medieval ages and so on in and in the in the discussion for instance about um about the Crusades in the framework of good Christianity versus evil heathens, there is no neutrality. But if world politics and, and in general, like um, people's relationships are framed more in realist terms, and I mean with realists, I mean like Machiavelli, I mean um, Clausewitz and, and uh, you know, people who just describe how power politics works. In that framework, there's much more conceptual space because, as Clausewitz said, right, um, war is the continuation of politics by other means. Yeah. In that framework, neutrality is the continuation of politics by the same means. As in, if if war is really just something states do in order to kind of get what they want, then not doing war and remaining out of it and just having your own position and just trying to remain friends with both parties of a war is, is just a rational choice. So, but again, to come back to this, like if we have a heinous crime, like let's say a genocide that is happening and you don't do anything about it, then it is utterly clear how that then looks like being complicit in this crime, right? So... The framing of what's, what is actually happening and the framing of it are essential in order to determine whether neutrality is a understandable position or a heinous crime itself. And I can't answer that. I can only analyze it. Uh, is there a difference between the terms uh, neutrality and independence? Um, there, there, is a, there is a difference. I mean, let me, let me put it this way. Um, especially in international relations, states that are not independent usually cannot really be neutral because if you are an appendix to another state <laughs> or you're you're joined by the hip to another state because you're in an in a military alliance or because you are in a in a, in a relationship where you depend on the other one if that if this one wants to go to war or ends up in war then you usually end up with it in there right um so independence in the sense of having having the ability to take political actions that are different from another one is kind of a prerequisite. But neutrality itself is still different because it it implies that you choose to remain in good terms with your friend and the, the enemy of the friend, right? And the, the, the problem for the neutral, I, I always use this um, metaphor, is that you're the third part in a, in a triangle, right? You have belligerent one, belligerent two, and this can be also a trade war or whatever, and you're the third part in the triangle. 
And the fact that you try to remain to remain in good terms with both of these, while these two are at war with each other, that will automatically lead to both of th these these poles trying to pull you in on their side or push you away from the other one, right? And that's what we are seeing right now. Um, you know, secondary sanctions of the U.S. levied against uh, against states or companies that do not comply with U.S. sanctions, even if those state, if, even if the companies are outside of U.S. jurisdiction, that's a typical mechanism to try to push neutral states in the war between Russia and Ukraine to their side or away from the other one. And it's it's a, it's a typical typical problem in, in any kind of conflict constellation that the neutrals will be pushed and pulled by both sides because they're not completely in one or the other camp. So when I thought about neutrality, I was looking this up and several, I guess, people in the neutrality studies um, area were talking about the non-aligned movement as an example, as one example of neutrality. And for us, for Armenians, especially when we follow the conflict between Armenia and Azerbaijan over the years, Azerbaijan was able to get a lot of favors from the non-aligned movement in terms of political statements. I'm not sure how serious they were, but for instance, uh, I believe in 2012, the ministerial meeting for the non-aligned movement, was a, that was the only one where the non-use of force, which is one of the main principles, you know, in international relations and especially in UN and so forth was emphasized. Everyone else after that was, you know, territorial integrity of Azerbaijan, territorial integrity of Azerbaijan and so forth. So isn't this a case where supposed neutrality in the form of this nine line movement is actually becoming a block uh, that can pressure Armenia into actions? And how would you assess the, the one experience of this uh you know, non-aligned movement as an international organization in the practice of neutrality. And, you know, the end result we have so far, I'm not sure if there are other examples, but I just know this one because it was particular to us. Yeah, no, it's a good point. But, you know, the a misunderstanding is to think that neutrals and non-aligned states um, take no position. They usually do the opposite. They always take a position, but they take their own. And the non-aligned movement is an example of a couple of states coming together who didn't want to be sucked into the bipolarity and actually made it a, a political statement to say like guys this bipolar system that you're creating here these two blocks and your demand to join either this one or that one it ain't working for us we we don't want that we don't want a bipolar world we do our own thing and what did these two poles do they automatically framed it in their in their in their conceptualization said like oh if you're neither with us nor with the other one then you're a third pole you're the other one and, and the non-alignment said like, no not really i mean we're just we're not a consolidated block we are just a couple of countries who don't want to participate in this in this bipolar BS. And that's why then you find also within the non-aligned movement certain principles, but they're very loose. And the non-aligned movement itself is very, very loose. It's just a club of countries that, that, that meet every once in a while on, on ministerial or, or summit level. And they had like, you know, various policies over the time. And when it comes to Armenia and Azerbaijan, I would think that they were the... Um, one thing is that they were very anti-colonial um, in spirit, um, which is one of the reasons why a lot of these countries would stick so much to the idea of uh, territorial integrity, because it's kind of hardwired into many of them um, that were formerly colonized, that are uh, territorial in integrity and self-rule and so on is, is very important to them. And then they would have, in, like, of course, among themselves, inconsistent policies towards Armenia and Azerbaijan. But th that also has to do with the fact that Armenia and Azerbaijan is a conflict in the, that is similar on the outside, but works differently on the inside from the, uh, from the anti-colonial struggle that most of these countries went through, with the exception of Yugoslavia, which within the yeah. NAM itself had a special position. And, and just as background for our listeners who might not be aware, Armenia was part of the, uh, it, it, or and still is part of the CSTO, which is uh, a, a defensive alliance that was set up by Russia. Meanwhile, Azerbaijan left that alliance, and essentially that's how it uh, made the decision to become part of this nine alignment movement, whereas Armenia was not a member. 
Yeah, I, I still kind of feel that just, you know, by becoming a member and Armenia not being a member, like other members, you know, try to uh, give some favors to Azerbaijan, obviously. But maybe maybe they sh the question to ask is how significant was that support? Uh, because I still believe that if you're a member of non-aligned movement, you still should support some minimal global order, which is, you know, not endorsing uh you know violence and not endorsing the use of force in my opinion yeah the, the the problem is that in the international sphere we have like competing concepts right and we can see how even the people who claim to hold up the rules based international order <laughs> those are the number one people who always strategically deploy whichever is best you know um if in the case of Kosovo, self-independence um, um, and, and self-rule of populations is the name of the game, then we go for that one. But if in the in the case of Ukraine and the Donbass, a territorial integrity is is more is better for us, then we go for that principle. And you know, territorial integrity integrity and um self-rule, of course, they contradict each other. And so you have an entire tool set of principles that even that especially the West then chooses at will which one is ever better for our geopolitical interest. We actually had a specific question in this area because we have had the situation of two international principles that conflict with each other seemingly, that of territorial integrity and um, the, the uh, principle of self-determination. How does neutrality actually stand in a situation like that, uh, seemingly between right and wrong? It doesn't. Neutrality itself is not a is not a concept that has any kind of metaphysical existence, right? It's really it's really just more or less a a principle and a tendency of in conflict situations that you sometimes have third part. You always you always have actors that are connected to conflict parties, but that themselves do not want to be part of it, as in it makes no sense for them to choose. And, you know, Armenia and Azerbaijan are actually a good example. I mean, which one did Japan choose? Which one did Japan support? Japan doesn't support either of them because Japan doesn't even really understand what this is mm -hmm. about <laughs> and has no stake in it and doesn't want to be sucked into it. So just leave me alone from the position of Japan. So although Japan doesn't officially declare neutrality, but in the conflict itself, it's, it's more or less a third party actor and it will naturally try to interact with both because why not? Um, while, while not taking a position on the actual conflict. And this is, this has, happens regularly and it happens in inter interpersonal connections as well if you two had a fight between each other and you ask me um, then i would I would naturally try to kind of be nice to both of you and figure out what's happening right so it's it's a tendency of conflict systems to produce third party neutrals in that sense and i think it was exactly like that when the osce minsk group that was set up as a mediator uh, a body, international body, mandated to deal with the status of nagorno karabakh Artsakh yeah. for us. Yeah. Um, for 30 years, basically, they kicked the can down the road uh, about the status of Artsakh because there is no right and wrong, but there's absolutely no solution until somebody says uh, which one is going to win. And so the state of neutrality just went on until it could not, until it just basically ended up in war. Yeah. The, the the problem with territorial conflicts is that they easily and, and immediately create zero-sum games, right? It's either yours or ours. Nagorno-Karabakh is either, either Azerbaijani or Armenian. The only way of remedying that is by um, breaking out of that of that framework and create um, create greater integ integrated solutions in the way that you know the European Union for all of its flaws and mistakes. Um, was able to to like make certain conflicts go away because you integrate into a larger framework, right? That's why uh, an important reason why Northern Ireland stopped being a problem because Ireland and the UK both became part of the European Union, which lived, which created a customs union, which made sure that that you know the island could work. Um, naturally, and something like that integration into a, a greater whole in order to 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 cooperate is something that would be necessary for for um, for an equitable solution to the the conflict. But that's far away from happening. And it, the neutrality position there is, of course, doesn't help to solve the the, the situation. If like third states stay neutral, the only thing it does it's it doesn't 
add more fuel to the fire. Because if you're looking at the moment of what's happening in Ukraine, one of my arguments is that if foreign forces hadn't intervened on both sides, you know, in the in the internal conflict of Ukraine, we would never have gotten to this huge um, problematic war um, had not the West tried to influence Kiev in 2014 and so on and had Russia not not poured in weapons to the to the um, to the rebels in the east and had then the West not added more weapons to that one, then we wouldn't have that huge um, structural conflict, which is now really, I mean, it's on the verge of destroying the entirety of Ukraine. So in a sense, the staying out of a lot of states from the conflict in Armenia and Azerbaijan, at least it, it makes sure that the conflict remains small, but the conflict doesn't go away and it was still war and it was still bad. Um, so it doesn't it doesn't solve the problem. Speaking of Ukraine, you know, we, we frequently hear the war in Ukraine as uh, maybe heralding the the new multipolar world. I haven't seen a clear definition of what multi what the multipolar world means and what attributes it would have. Uh, for instance, would there be more or less peace? But also, you know value systems and the fact that there isn't a global value system that is being imposed and this could you know a multipolar world could allow more um, variance and more diversity in terms of uh, local value systems what are your thoughts about this and you know how how could we tell that the multipolar world is here well a multipolar the world multipolarity just refers to a observable fact that instead of having one center, political center of decision making, um, whose um, structures, the structures that it creates in the international world that are used by everybody, which is a unipolar world, or a bipolar one, um, as during the Cold War, where the basic structures of the way that the global system is built is either you, you work with the institutions institutions the Western Washington has created, including the monetary system and so on, or you are integrating into the Soviet the Soviet system of how they did things, right? The Soviets had their own way, and I, I don't think I need to tell you guys of that this was different. It's just like economics work differently and, and trade work differently and communication channels work differently, but they worked. They worked until they stopped working, but they did. And so does the West. And a multipolar world then refers to having at least more than two of these and having having other options in which the communication, economics, trade, um, education and so on can happen and does happen and that you go through multiple nodes, right? And in terms of, of power projection that you have more than just two countries that can do war because... We, we have the Chinese now, which have their independent capabilities, very independent capabilities, and they produce them themselves, you know, and production, self-producing your own weapons and so on is quite important for states who are, who are playing on the, on, the, on the global level, as we can see now. Um, if Russia indeed had been cut off um, uh, of everybody else, they would still have been able to produce a good part of the weapons they need themselves internally, whereas the West is able to produce what they need themselves, and the Chinese do so too, to a very large extent. At the end of the day, nobody is 100% uh, self-sufficient, but they are much, much more self-sufficient than, let's say, uh, Switzerland, Armenia, or Azerbaijan, right? We depend upon integration with others because we're just too small. We just can't do it ourselves. And multipolarity then refers to both of these phenomena that you have more more than just two um, uh, military capable states, and you have you have several structures that they build, and that of course <laughs> has a big potential for conflict. But it all but what we have seen over the past is that even um, bipolarity and unipolarity were not structures that brought peace, not at all. I mean, there's now very good academic research that shows that the U.S intervened more in international, I mean, abroad, foreign interventions, more after 45 than before, and more after uh, 89 than before, between 45 and 89, as in the end of the Cold War did not lead the US to the unipolar power to scale down foreign interventions. It actually led to an upscaling. And we've seen horrible wars and millions of people have perished, right, between 89 and 
2024, the unipolar moment or 2022, the unipolar moment was not a moment of peace. So the question is, how do we deal with a multipolar world? And how is it possible to build structures that even though they are not necessarily integrated into each other, like a, like a bridge, build something that is stable, you know, or like a roof where each individual tile would fall to the, to the ground, was it not for the rest of the structure, right? Hovik, let's just take a moment here. We'd like to remind our listeners to go to our donate page, podcasts.groom.org slash donate, or just go to podcasts.groom.org and there's a donate link there. And consider buying us a coffee or better yet, become a sustaining member of Groom through our Patreon link and give us monthly. You know, there aren't that many shows like us uh, who digest Armenian news weekly and bring you interesting discussions relevant to it in English language and in a regular manner. We have always operated as a labor of love. And we're not only nonprofit, but we're also non-budget, unfortunately. So we rely on listeners like you to help us. Just two to three friends who have committed our life's time and effort to understand the world around Armenians and Armenia and sharing that understanding with you. So we will continue to do our work as we always have. But your support will help us expand our reach to more people who are interested in Armenian affairs around the world. So please visit our donate page. Again, podcasts.groom.org forward slash donate and consider supporting us. Thank you in advance. We appreciate your listening to us and we take that trust and your support very seriously. Thank you. So let me ask then, uh, since we're Armenian, uh, let's talk a little bit more about Armenia. Uh, in, in the previous discussion we had with Glenn Deason, we asked him whether the Nagorno-Karabakh war was a trap set up for Russia by the West, given what was coming in Ukraine. Uh, he said that if Russia did take sides uh, in the fighting, then it would be a trap because, uh, you know, you can't please one side or the other in this conflict. And as it turned out, uh, Russia needs... Uh, Turkey uh, in you know in all in the current war and Russia obviously is relying heavily on Azerbaijan and Europe is relying on Azerbaijan for energy and so forth and everyone is buying Azerbaijani branded gas which is in reality um, Russian gas so our question was do you think that you know back then in 2020 the wheels were already in motion for the current war in Ukraine and essentially. Karabakh was an early attempt at opening up a second front against Russia uh, to, uh, you know, what are your thoughts about the, the war in Karabakh uh, in the context of the current conflict between Russia and the West? It's a good question. And I, to be honest, I don't know enough about what happened in Armenia and Azerbaijan, for instance, when it comes to the NGOs, whether the National End Endowment for Democracy and so on has sponsored a lot of, uh, a lot of activities or not. The one thing that we can say is that the um, the conflict in between Armenia and Azerbaijan has been going on for more than 30 years, right? This one was on hold, as you said, and everybody understood that it is unresolved and kind of everybody understood that at some point this will probably flare up again, right? It's like in one way or another. Um, as soon as Armenia and Azerbaijan came out of the Soviet Union, the, the common structure was gone, and this this problem like became became huge, right? So the um, I would rather tend to think that it's probably more or less natural processes inside between these two camps, especially also that um, you know the political decisions that Mr. Pashkinyan took, and uh, also vis a vis vis a vis Russia and, and Azerbaijan uh, managed to build up its army. I mean, they managed to just build over decades their army to the point where they could win this war, and then that they used a moment that looked opportune, and in the end turned out to have like, as in only military rationale from the viewpoint of military rationale, it was they judged correctly that now was the time where we could take it because they did. Um, so I would think that this is probably more internal um, developments also because the West, uh, like um, the, the attention in the Caucasus to, in my, from my view, has always been more on Georgia 
than on Armenia and Azerbaijan. Um, also with like m invested money into uh, into Georgia and influence campaigns, and also to Russia, Georgia um, kind of takes a a more prominent role. And there we have a conflict between Russia and Georgia directly, whereas in Armenia it uh, and Azerbaijan, this is a typical moment when Russia actually didn't want to pick sides, when Russia itself is kind of a neutral actor, although it is with Armenia part of the uh, of a of a basically defensive alliance, but for for real political reasons, had every every incentive to just not take sides or only if push comes to shove, but because Mr. Pashkinyan then didn't even want <laughs> Russian intervention, Vladimir Putin said, like, what should I do? <laughs> right. What That's should I right. do? They don't want it. So, yeah. Sorry. I, I would agree with you. The only uh, official evidence that we have is this 2019 leaked Rand Corporation report, which mentioned like things that the U.S. could do strategically in its conflict with Russia. And one of them sp explicitly mentioned stocking up uh, or using the Karabakh conflict, but yeah, uh, yeah I guess you know, it's it's a uh, you know we can we can talk about this some more, but there's so much to to, to cover. But since you mentioned Pashinyan, um, you know, since the 2020 war officially, but many would say even before, uh, Pashinyan has taken the dramatic step of moving Armenia away from Russia's orbit, uh, frequently playing on emotions of the populace, which is in a, still in a post-war. Uh, you know, uh, depression, uh, you know, and they can't fully forgive Russia's inactions in Karabakh, regardless of the reasons for it. Um, and this policy has been shared by a coterie of Western funded academics. You mentioned National Institute, uh, National Endowment for Democracy. There are a large number of such institutes in Armenia. And just today, uh, two, ac two Western academics who are of Armenian origin uh, penned an article that was published in the National Interest with a sub-headline that says, Armenia can offer the United States a foothold in Russia's backyard. Uh, just that statement itself seems to offer Armenia essentially as a tool in the fight between Russia and the, the West. Meanwhile, Ospet and I are almost sick and tired of asking this question of what is the benefit to Armenia in this um, you know, uh, calculus? Um, and uh, but many uh, analysts agree that this is essentially what is happening. The West is using Armenia as a tool, and again, we can't see the benefit. Do you see any upside for Armenia in becoming a U.S. foothold uh, against Russia? In the or region? actually, if I may add, is there a path to neutrality from where Armenia is right now? I mean, just to 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 answer your question, Hovik. No, there is no benefit to be a tool and to be the implementation point of a proxy war. And if you if you're not sure about that, go and ask the Ukrainians at the moment in in the in the trenches. You know, this is the horrible thing, the the perverse thing of this proxy war method that really the US has perfected by now. You know, in the in the Vietnam War, they still needed to send their own troops, but by now they have figured out how to how to manage to have other states fight the wars that they want to have. And th this is difficult to do, and it takes a long time, and it's very sophisticated. It's just for the tool itself. I mean, it is a tool. I mean, nobody cares about the hammer. Nobody cares about. I mean, if the hammer breaks, the hammer breaks. Fine, I'm going to get another one, right? You don't want to be the tool, and that's why I would like to sell more neutrality to places. Not in the sense of you should not take any position or any action, but you need to be aware that it's better to have your own position and to guard your own interest toward both sides. This is actually something that I think the you, the current Georgian government tries to do the Georgian dream government, because on the one hand, they still have uh, two territories of theirs occupied by Russia and they don't have uh, diplomatic relations with Russia. On the other hand, they try not to piss Russia off further to um, to get a second invasion. And they try to keep the Americans out to not be used as a tool in order to open a second front, which some strategic thinkers in the West would love to do. And the guys that you talked about obviously think that it would be great for Armenia to prove its loyalty and that downstream after you you become the implementation point and do the bleeding, or the empire, that then you will be rewarded. 
by being on the right side of history, first in the history books, it will always say like Armenia was when everything changed and Armenia saved Europe and Armenia saved the West. That's I think that's what's going through the mind of these people. And secondly, once that has happened, then all the riches will come because the West will be so grateful and thankful and they will, they will integrate Armenia into the European Union and then it's going to be a happy ever after uh, with gold and BMWs and, and Teslas, right? And I can assure you, this is not what's gonna happen. This is not what you do to tools. You don't put them into a into a Tesla. You put them back into a into the shed where they came from. So do not be used by anyone, not by Russia, not by the not by the Americans. Do your own thing that makes sense power politically, because then you have the best chances that you're actually gonna get to a Tesla and a BMW, or you know, to a Chinese uh, BYD. Uh, BYD, which are fantastic cars, and and use them against each other. The 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 and, and you know the, the Russia would would do a similar thing if they could. <laughs> so it's not to say like one is better than the other. It's to say that it's better to keep an independent and somewhat neutral but integrated relationship. And some states are very are very good at that. I mean, look at how India is profiting from from the situation in, in, in the way that they are able to get uh, cheaper oil and resell it even to the Europeans. And, um, uh, you know, usually it's more beneficial to try to play with both sides than to put your lot into one camp only. Even the Turks are, although they are part of NATO, are now playing with both camps <laughs> because it's utterly clear that play uh, throwing their lot in with the Europeans only a they don't want them b um, why would they at this point so um, I hope that answers the question. You mentioned several times, and I think we 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 stepped on this question of different institutions and and multipolarity. To me, the logic of multipolarity seems to dictate less global institutionalism and more local and regional approaches or bilateral approaches. Uh, at least in the case of the UN and other similar organizations, we're seeing that their role is diminishing to the point of irrele irrelevance. Uh, but at the same time, we're seeing reorganizations and growth of other organizations, such as BRICS, SCC, the Shanghai Cooperation Council, as well as the Eurasian Economic Union. Can you tell us what is the role of BRICS, uh, SCC, and some of these other institutions? Are they going to be the same style uh, alliances or blocks that existed until today, or how do you see them evolving? And also more about each of them. Why do we need two and why do we need, and, and is there room for others as well? There is. So a multipolar world would automatically imply that you have uh, uh, um, just multiple organizations and multiple structures and networks that on the face of, of them, they are, um, exclusive mutually exclusive but in matter of fact they will start they they work together and we can see that already how it's happening right how um uh, how turkey apparently asked russia russia to join the BRICS while being part of nato um and how the european union is of course interacting with other regional arrangements and is itself interacting with with the states below and with with outside forces and how we will have new payment systems right that are that BRICS is currently working on and then and then states will will pick and choose and most likely a lot of states will try to implement both of them right <laughs> because that would make most sense because redundancy makes sense um so we will have a flourishing of international organizations and it, within that framework uh, the UN will probably become one of several uh, international organizations that do things. So the idea of the UN in the beginning was to be world government, right? After the League of Nations and top down, top of the pyramid, the UN Security Council, and then they enforce peace on everybody. Now that never happened. The UN just became one of the different organizations among others. And they will probably remain so because one of the thing is, or even though we, we call it irrelevant, it's only irrelevant in the sense that it's not able to impose this structure. But China says uh, we we want to work on the international system through the UN. Russia says so. The US says so. The EU says so. I mean, one of the only consensus we still have <laughs> is that everybody says we adhere to the UN Charter, which is actually a good thing, right? It, it grounds us. It gives us a common a common understanding of what we actually strive for. Then they implement it differently and they interpret it differently. But the understanding that the UN is important and we want it to be important is still there. I haven't so far heard any one of the big ones or the small ones saying like we will exit this goddamn UN and then we will fight that evil 
empire like th that's not what we hear so we will rather hear like different versions of this of the same of the same idea within different kinds of structures and BRICS is then one of them but BRICS is a loose structure just like the G7 and you can see how BRICS tries to unite even enemies right last year they invited at the same time uh, Iran and Saudi Arabia they combine China and India and let's not forget China and India have like huge territorial disputes right but BRICS is trying to be a club for those who, even among rivals, they still want to find common ground, which makes them institutionally different, of course, from NATO or the EU, which demand uh, strict adherence to the code. And then everybody has to be on the same page. BRICS says, like, now nah, we can be on different pages on some on some parts, but we can still cooperate and it's still overall beneficial. Um, so it's kind of a different philosophy and mentality behind these behind these institutions but we will see rather more of those and also the Shanghai Cooperation Organization um, and then states will just have several outlets and it will be much more busy and not channeled through one single institution and do you have any predictions on the upcoming BRICS meeting in October in Kazan and I think that one of the main uh, themes or top topics being discussed is uh, you know this de-dollarization or is it you know, a common BRICS currency that might come forth. Do you have any, you know, thoughts on that? I doubt that BRICS will create its own currency um, because it would make things just unnecessarily complicated. It's already complicated. So it makes more sense that they would try to probably work with some form of currency basket um, in order to, you know, have like a common... Um, money has three functions, right? Uh, unit of account... Um, store of value and medium of exchange, universally accepted since like Plato, basically. And what one of the first things you would want is a common um, unit of account so that you don't need to convert everything into US dollars in order to have a common understanding what things cost. So they will probably try to work on that one because it is the easiest one and least consequential. Um, but it would have an impact on, on, on perception. So that's my guess where they're going. The other thing I can say is that we know now from Vladimir Putin what he said recently that um, BRICS is working on a new membership status. And that makes sense because BRICS is now running into the problem that they're getting too big. You know, when when you're only five states, it's easy to run on a principle of consensus. I mean, even for five states, it's difficult to get consensus, but still feasible. And now they're at nine, I think, members. And they still have consensus model, right? I mean, everybody needs to agree for something to happen. And if they go to 34, uh, which they now have applications for, it will become almost un, uh, unmanageable. So either they need to change something in the way that they make decisions, or they need to kind of create loser relationship with others. And it seems that they're going in the, sec the, the second route and try to have something like a membership light. Um, and we will see what that is. But um, BRICS has to has like grown a lot uh, conceptually and with its members. And now it needs to deal with the, the fallout from that. Right. <laughs> As in how do we that remain? They're probably going to have to announce the BRICS Security Council and everybody else becomes a <laughs> light membership. Yeah, well, they, they are not a, a military um, alliance, right? They I are a, a trade bloc. So, but still, how th this is the problem. How, org how to organize ourselves to still mm -hmm. remain agile, but have an impact and not de degrade into either a UN, which is institutionally blocked, because it cannot take any decisions, or an irrelevant kind of, you know, club of, of just, just a trade agreement. You want to be more than that, but not an, a UN that, that, is, that cannot move. So the last topic that we wanted to discuss with you, Pascal, is uh, supply chain security uh, or in a multipolar world. Uh, with yesterday's uh, pager attack by Israel, I believe a new Rubicon was crossed in terms of what is permissible for states to do internationally uh, and threats that smaller and less, I guess, technically sovereign countries uh, will need to consider. Uh, just briefly, it appears that Israel was able to either at manufacturing time or during shipment time implant explosives into thousands of pagers uh, destined allegedly for use by Hezbollah in Lebanon. Not just pagers, but it appears that cell phones, uh, communication radios, and even solar panels were reported to, uh, to be exploding all over Lebanon over the last few days, uh, resulting in multiple deaths and uh, injuries to thousands, including innocent bystanders and even children. Uh, regardless of one's stance on the Middle East conflict, 
Uh, I think that this attack raises many questions about the security of basic technology and other goods that countries uh, you know, rely upon. I can think of only a few countries that, for instance, would be able to manufacture their own cell phones and, uh, and networking equipment. So how do regular and small countries uh, get the assurance uh, or you know, ensure that their networking equipment doesn't have a backdoor for the NSA or the Mossad, I guess? Or that their cell phones don't uh, suddenly explode one day, you know, when uh, someone else doesn't like uh, the opinion of their politicians or political actors or whatever, revolutionaries, whatever you could call them. Yeah, this is um, it's a very important question. And it's um, at this point, you know, it's difficult to find an international crime that Israel hasn't yet committed. Uh, but this one, this one has huge impact because I think no, no one, all of us, we knew that potentially our Zoom call can be listened into, that our phones might record what we are saying and 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 send it for analysis, right? We all were aware of that, but that these things could explode and kill us. We knew that that hypothetical this could could be the case, but now we've seen the first time a state that uses an attack like this on an on an adversary. Um, of massive industrial sabotage, and it is sabotage, right? It's it's a very classic means of warfare, but it is sabotage, and it's it's very sophisticated sabotage. And um, this this changes, and, and I, I predict this will change hugely of how how uh, um, technological security will also be viewed from now on, because the matter of the fact is only large states that have technological sovereignty can assure to a reasonable degree that this doesn't happen to themselves. And but and those are really just the United States, Russia, and China that can make sure that their supply chains remain remain proper. Uh, smaller states, Switzerland, Armenia, Azerbaijan, the Euro, even most states in the European Union, we don't have that ability. We don't have we don't have the production facility. We 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 depend on integrated um, uh, supply chains. And the only thing left to do is then to try to implement monitoring uh, monitoring to kind of at least scan for this kind of stuff. But th this will be a huge undertaking um, and it will make everybody of us weary to to keep our, our phones on us. Right. Um, because we don't know. Are are these batteries that can explode with like little metal balls in them to create even more damage? Are they maybe already in here? How would I know? <laughs> we can't. Um, it's um, it's a very shocking event, and it undermines trust. That's the worst thing. It undermines trust in these supply chains. And the, the, my prediction is that uh, what we will see now is is going to be a lot of um, over the next years, a lot of in investments into trying to monitor supply chains and at least take out the the chance for this happening. But so, how somebody like Hezbollah or how small states want to do that. I don't, they, they don't have the capacity. We just don't have the capacity. So we now all have a Damocles seer, a sword over our heads, unfortunately. Yeah, almost literally. Um, yeah, it's very scary, very scary. And this is just unprecedented because it it takes <laughs> away, it, it changes the rules of the game. Israel, again, yeah. changed the, rule of the rules of the game. The interesting thing is like, if anything like that happened to Israel, we would already have full-blown war, right? That's absolutely clear. But for some reason, Israel is the only state in the world at the moment that has an opt out of everything. It's the only one that can attack uh, foreign embassies and get away with it uh, and, uh, um, you know, <laughs> do a genocide and get away with it. So this is just another one of these moments. The good thing is that overall, 99 percent of the others, they don't, they're not under the same set of rules, because if this became if this became a general the rule norm. that you can just yeah. sabotage each other's pages and phones. Well, you know, there's a lot of Chinese phones on U.S. markets. I mean, if the Chinese get any idea, I mean, you could immediately kill a lot of Americans if you wanted and 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 got to do that. Right. And But this is not yeah. how, what they do. This is not the level to which these 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 states compete at the moment. Luckily, luckily. And. Uh, right now, we're only talking about uh, technology, which is something physical and tangible. But I mean, now I'm starting to think about bio warfare <laughs> and what's possible and what's, uh, God forbid, you know, if that's being weaponized. Um, but one more thing that I'm interested in, because, uh, you know, from my experience working in large uh, multinational tech companies, I know that even then, even these tech companies were thinking about how to secure themselves from government uh you know um 
espionage and uh, in terms of physical networking you, equipment that you buy, let's say from a company and ensure that it's tra customers traffic is, is secure and so forth. Um, and we know, of course, the experience of China with this Chinese firewall that they have been able to create a local internet uh, within China. Do you see this trend growing? And do you know if anyone is studying this? For instance, I believe in Russia, they call this network sovereignty, um, where, you know, for instance, could Russia set up its own version of the, you know, the internet, but then once you start having multiple countries with their own internets, how do they collaborate? You know, is, is there any study in this area being done or that you're aware of? I'm pretty sure there must be, but I don't, I couldn't point you to anyone. But this is something that we should do a good, a good thorough Google search on because I'm pretty sure people must look at that. And, and this will only increase, right? Um, this fragmentation of the internet. And we can see it already in the in the in the way that, you know, Facebook is itself a, a, a microcosm of the of the internet and 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 so is um Telegram and so is uh YouTube and um, and now certain parts of the internet are blocked, even in the free West, right? RT and so yeah. on. Um, and the, the internet becomes more and more bubbleized, and this will probably increase. I, the hope I have is that, that this will also in, increase yeah. the incentive for people to create counter technologies in order to bridge the bubbles, right? <laughs> exactly. And that's where I was leading to. Because like one of the things, for instance, that BRICS could do, uh, and I've been thinking about this, is create a technological standard that would allow them, for instance, to... Because a single country, especially a small country like Armenia, can't go to uh, Qualcomm or, uh, you know, some chip manufacturer and say, you know, I need to be able to inspect your chip. But if these larger trade alliances as a block create a technological standard and say, you must allow us visibility and assurance that uh, your technology doesn't contain any backdoors or things like that. That might be uh, an up and coming role that these uh, regional organizations like BRICS may have uh, say so in. I'm not sure. Yeah, the problem is the BRICS states themselves, a lot of them don't have an interest in that. I mean, China is one of the BRICS, right? <laughs> they have they, they cut their what there's off. The Russians are also not famous for having an absolute free internet, although they they are very no, important. It's not in freedom, sense, it's, but... it's just uh, assurance that they can trust whatever the technology is doing. So if they buy a firewall, they can trust that, that some other government doesn't have backdoor. This is going to be a very difficult issue, Ovik, because it's going to go down to the software. Basically, you just have to know if the software is... Uh, and it, yeah, you go, you go down the stack. You go down the stack. So it's in the software, now it's in the firmware. And I think there's this movement that says, you know, Firmware should be open source and you should be able to inspect open source. Yeah. But then they, they, there's a hardware level below they that. Say so. that. <laughs> there's two ways of doing this, right? One is software open source so that anyone can inspect and that, that outside experts can actually monitor and so on. And Apple tries to do that, right? Apple tries to increase in, increase trust by saying we have a, we have standards that, ex, that external experts can monitor, therefore trust us. The second way is by implementing technologies that by the very design that they're made are uncompromisable. The, the example here, which was a hype a few years ago, is blockchain, right? Blockchain is in its principle made in a way that it is not controllable by one single um, actor. Um, but unfortunately, so far, we haven't seen a big like kind of victory of one of these technologies. So, so the only thing that we still have, which connects us, is that the entire IT infrastructure is still built upon same principle uh, principles which rely on IP addresses and which rely on ones and zeros, right? And as the and everything that's built on top then becomes proprietary. Um, the question is, will there be a outside technology that is uncrackable and unhackable by in principle, not even and logically not even by supercomputers, by uh, by um, quantum computers, because we are now getting into that space. Yeah, definitely. It, if that happens, then we have a chance. If it doesn't happen, then we have to live with a fragmented uh, uh, internet and we have to use VPNs and hope VPN will work. But my prediction is that probably um, in, in the, the interest, the shared interest of US, China and Russia to make sure VPNs cannot be used anymore until they, uh, as, as they are now, will be so big that probably they'll find ways to make sure that they can bubbleize the internet even more because it's social control. 
at the end of the day, yeah. what states want is social control over their populations, because what you want is the other ones to rise up against their leaders, but not against you, yours against you. <laughs> and they try to play that game against each other, which yes. is very old. It's very old, uh, but that's why it will continue. Agree. Well, thank you for that input. And thank you, Pascal, for uh, coming on our show and hope we can uh, have you back again soon. Thank you very much. Hovind. Thank you thank very you much. Yes, that was a See very interesting time. conversation. Talk to you soon. Well, folks, that's our show today. The episode was recorded on September 18, 2024. We've been talking with Dr. Pascal Lota, who is an associate professor of law at the University of Kyoto in Japan. For more information on him and everybody else in the show, please check the show notes, podcast.groong.org slash episode number. Let's keep in mind one more thing. Hovig and I would really like you, our listeners, uh, to go to our YouTube pages, the video pages, and make your comments and let your thoughts be known to us. And we would also be delighted if you'd become a sustaining, supporting member of our podcasts. Go to podcast.groom.org slash donate and sign up for a monthly giving through one of our tiers. You could become a Lahmajun luminary. You could become a Surge supporter. You could become a Harissa uh, humanitarian. We would love for you to be in any one of those categories and give on a monthly basis. We thank you in advance. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.